together. I just want to pray and really commit this rest of this service to God as we uh, open His Word. And some of you know we're in the middle of um, a series on Daniel, on the life of Daniel, and, and sort of the the history of the the Daniel narrative. We're not looking at every one of the twelve chapters and all of the. Uh, visions and dreams that he had, but just looking at the lessons we can learn from the Daniel and his friends in this wonderful book of the Bible. So let's, uh, as we're going to open the Word, we're going to read some of it today. We're going to draw some really important uh, uh, points and learnings from it. So let's commit ourselves to say, God, speak to us, eh? Yeah, Lord God, we thank you that we can gather in this place with like-minded people who share a love for you and a desire to know you and understand you and, and, and be more like you. And so, Lord, we commit this next short time to you where we open the Bible, open your word. It is written, and it is written for our edification, for our growth. And, Lord, we want you to speak to us through these words. Lord, we want you to encourage us, we pray. Where we, need, where we are downheartened or discouraged. We want you, Lord, to build us up. We want you, Lord, to challenge us. We ask, Lord God, that by your Spirit you'd come and you would do what you want to do through the words that you have given. And, Lord, that you would apply them to our hearts and to our lives, that we might take a hold of your word and live fully for you. Amen. The scene around me took my breath away. Thousands and thousands of people surrounded me. And I witnessed every act of worship mentioned in the book of Psalms. Singing, shouting, lifted hands, laughter, clapping, chanting, dancing, joyful expressions of every variety. This is from Chris Hodges in his book, The Daniel Dilemma. The volume of so many vibrant voices escalated into a crescendo of exaltation. There were men, women, teens and children from various socioeconomic, cultural and educational backgrounds united together to celebrate the object of their devotion. The University of Alabama football team. And you could insert into that little scenario, I guess, World Cup football matches at Brisbane Stadium or Sydney Swans AFL matches. Or we probably won't mention the Test cricket at the moment, but uh, yeah, any of these arenas where thousands of people of all ages gather together. They dress up in the colours of the team. They paint their faces. They wear funny clothes, funny hats. They sing funny songs. They get excited. They jump up and down. They lift their hands and cheer. They sing the club song with gusto, although not always the most melodic and tuneful renditions are sung by some around us. We see, if you like, attributes of worship that we might sometimes consider part of a religious festival or uh, of, a, of, of a gathering of the true believers, we see that in so many different aspects of our culture and society today. And, uh, you know, we sometimes, Chris Hodges even makes the point, uh, some, gets him thinking about how sometimes it's normal for us to hoop and holler and scream and shout and paint our faces and high-five total strangers at a football game but feel uncomfortable to lift our hands or shout amen or clap our hands in a worship service. I mean, it's different, different backgrounds and all that in there. And God doesn't mind that we like sports, friends. We're not a downer on sports. I love sports watching sports. I enjoy those sorts of things, music and other things that bring joy to us. But what God does mind about is when we don't put him first. And so today we're talking about worship. We've been using Chris Hodge's book as a bit of a guide, The Daniel Dilemma. But today the theme is you are what you worship. And when we talk about worship, we're not just talking about the singing of songs. 
of praise songs in church or participating in a responsive reading or praying with a small group. These are expressions of worship, but true worship refers to what's going on in your heart. Amen? It's what's happening on the inside. One might say that if you're taking notes, you could jot this one down. I haven't put it up on the screen in this case. But this is a definition of worship. Worship is our response to what we value most. Worship is our response to what we value most. It's how we respond and react to the thing or the things that are most important to us. And if that's sport and football, it's going to be our number one time consumer for entertainment through the week. If it's, uh, if it's something else. But there's lots of ways that we can worship. But what real, this is it. Worship is our response to what we value most. And we're going to talk about worship today. It centers on these questions. Whom do I care about the most? Who or what gets my undevoted allegiance and loyalty? What's my top priority? Where does all my time and energy and money go? These are the things that we can ask when we start thinking about what is most important to us and then how do we respond to what is most important to us. Chris Hodges writes in his book, we are made to worship and if we're not worshiping our creator, God, then we're trying to put something else in his rightful place. And in, in, in a culture, in a society that doesn't really acknowledge the God as the creator of this world and doesn't really acknowledge the importance of worshipping God and creator, people have found all sorts of other gods to worship, all sorts of other idols to bow down to, whether it's money and success, whether it's sport or entertainment, or music, or films, whether it's even things that could be, can be good things like our careers, or our families, or our cars, or our house, whatever. There are so many things that we can, be, can become an idol to us, that we begin to worship because it takes more and more of our time, and our attention, and our love, and our devotion. Things that take us away sometimes from the devotion to the one true God. So we have a story today about worship and we have a story today about idolatry and it's a wonderful story in the Bible. It's one of the favorite ones that you'd have. I'm sure most children here would have had a story book of this story on their shelf when they were, when they were young. If you had you know, Bible story books, this is the story that many of you will know of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And so we're going to read that. We're going to split the Bible reading up into a few sections today and draw a thought from each of the sections. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, here we are, verse 1, verse 1 to 7. Remember King, ne king Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. Babylon had conquered Judah and Israel, or Judah, and all the people of Judah had been taken into captivity. Many of them were taken to Babylon, and those, the best of them, were actually uh, trained up to serve the king in the king's palace, in his courts. And Daniel was one of the best of the best, young man. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or, oh, can I remember their names? I should do. Hananiah, Matt, oh, anyway, it's in, it's in chapter one there. <laughs> What their names were before their names were changed. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll get... Oh, yeah, Shadrach, Meshach, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I had to find my notes where it was written down. But uh, their names were changed. They were put in charge. And so we get these three uh, in charge of many of the affairs of the Babylonian Empire at this point. So King Nebuchadnezzar, this is what happens next. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And he sent messages to the high officers, the officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. And so all of these officials came and they stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then a herald shouted, Ho yay, ho yay. Oh, well, no, that's a different one. People of all races and nations and languages. Listen to the king's command. 
When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. I love that bit. The horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and the other musical instruments. We've got the symphony orchestra out. You know, we've got the best rock band of Babylon playing the tune. And when that music plays, what do people have to do? They have to bow down to the ground and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Verse 6, anyone who refuses to obey will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. And so at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Let's just pause for a moment there and focus on this this scene, try to get it in, in our heads. The music plays and it's grand and it's mighty. It's, it's an incredible audio visual experience for the people. A 90 foot statue in gold, nine foot wide. That's, that's big. Then the music plays and there's not just one instrument, there's lots of instruments, there's noise, there's, there's a sort of a big event going on here, there's something happening here. And friends, we need to be aware of the lure of multimedia in our lives and in our world today. This is an audio-visual moment God knows that we were created to worship something. And if we haven't got it clearly established in our heart and mind that we worship the unseen God, that we worship him in spirit and in truth, that he is number one in our lives, we will be lured by the the, the zither and all those instruments that they mentioned in the Bible. (laughs) And we will be influenced and, and, and seduced by the visuals of the world that surround us and drawn into them. This, you know, our, our, our enemy, the evil one, knows how we're created. And he knows that if he can substitute and recreate and, and, and lure us away with things that entice us, just sound and sights that just attract us and interest us and fill our senses, that we will be Entice. We need to be aware that there is a lure in the multimedia and it's probably more pronounced in this generation than it has ever been in human history. My friend Jack from Toowoomba uh, made a trip to North Korea. He, uh, he went with a group uh, that, were, that were Christians and they went just as a tourist because that's, you can't go there with a missions group. <laughs> But they just took the time to silently pray for the people of Korea while they were there, and uh, North Korea while they were there. And uh, he went over, over to North Korea just on this tourist visit. You're not allowed to take Bibles. You know, it's a very, very secular, pagan culture. And they very much worship their ancestors and very much worship their leaders. And there's a site that is very, very notable in North Korea And it's the statues that have been created of President Kim Il-sung and General Kim Jong-il. And these statues are a similar height to the statues that we read about in Daniel chapter 3. In fact, Daniel, the story in Daniel, it's 90 feet high. Um, These are 72 feet or 22 meters tall, these two statues that are in North Korea, in Mansude, I think it's called. So a similar size, and there is a reverence that people have to, they have to approach these statues with reverence. Foreigners aren't forced to lay flowers and, and bow and worship, but the local people uh, are expected that they will bow down in reverence and honour to their Founders and emperors and leaders. In a very similar way, although I'm not sure that they have the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes and the other musical instruments, but there's nevertheless uh, a reverence, a, a, a worship 
a worshipful atmosphere. I just thought we should compare that. It's a good comparison because many of us would have seen those statues on documentaries or TV broadcasts in thinking about the people of North Korea, which is still today the most difficult country in the world to be a Christian. And it's illegal and you can be punished by death and imprisonment and your family as well if you... Uh, worship Jesus and put him first. Well, modern Western cultures are not so drawn to these obvious examples of, of idolatry, are we? But we sure are mugs to the audiovisual multimedia experience. Music, visuals, screens, technology, social media. Think of the lure. Think of the power of the combined power of the international pop music industry, Hollywood's film industry, and the social, social media industries uh, that have created the power of those groups combined in influencing attitudes and values and beliefs, in drawing people, alluring people away from the traditional understanding of God is an unseen God who is worthy of our adoration and praise to all sorts of crazy ideas and values and beliefs that come through. We need to just be aware. We just need to be aware of the lure of multimedia. Be aware that sometimes these things can be slowly and gradually, like the proverbial frog being boiled in a kettle, takes, you know, you, you, you do it slowly and the, the frog won't even jump out. You know, you just gradually just, wa- just warm up the water slowly, eventually be totally um, cooked. <laughs> but we wouldn't be suckers and mugs to idolatry, would be in modern, western, rational cultures. Well, I just thought a couple of examples just from the last 12 months that I thought were very interesting. And one was the opening of the Commonwealth Games. I don't know if any of you saw the opening ceremony of the Commonwealth Games when a giant bull came into the arena and people in an object, in a sort of dancers were sort of worshipping the bull. Now, I don't know if you know that the bull, the Baals of the Old Testament in the Bible, uh, also the Egyptian god of fertility was a bull, Apis, and it symbolized strength and fertility. But there was like uh, the people had bowed down and worshipping this huge bull that came in. Now, I know there's some history. There's some history apparently in the region of Birmingham. It was known for its bull ring. It was, but there, there was something about the way that this was put together the way that this, uh, the music, the way the dance, the way the opening ceremony took place, that you know, sort of mimic the uh, the worship of the the ancient I- idols uh, of fertility, the bull. You know, we got the golden calf that got built or got made. You know, when Moses was up getting a word from God, and the people were drawn. People are. Humans are so easily lured by the audio and the visual experience of life. And then there was a performance this year at the, uh, the Grammy Awards, the biggest night of nights for movies and television in the US. And we had a presentation by Sam Smith where he dressed as the devil and had demons dancing around him, worshipping him. Many people switched their televisions off. There were images of of chains and hellfire and sensuality in this red. You can see the, the horns on his head. And this is in the night of nights of the film industry that this world loves so much. And so we can move on from those pictures. And I'm really just giving them as an example because they're so blatant. Big events where there's sound, where there's sight, where there's crowds, where there's a huge audience. And we see these expressions. There are only examples. And because they're, I mean, you could research R&B pop video clips or satanic metal bands or the violence that is so often declared in rap music 
or the foul language in all those genres combined in the music industry and the film industry to start to see the power, the influence, the lure of the audiovisual in the world today. We have screens everywhere, even in church. We have screens everywhere, even in our pockets. We have them in our houses and we, can, we just need to be aware that sometimes the audio and the visual can be used by the enemy to lure us away from the things of God and from putting Jesus first and to certainly lure culture and lure and, and, and tempt and, and detract and distract uh, the people of our society and our culture today. You've only got to look at a sample of shows that are streaming on your television services or some of the Hollywood movies or YouTube clips and you find more of the same. Idolatry exists today. And I did point out those blatant examples. But it's actually the subtle lure of the audiovisual experience that cripple many Christians. We might well turn off the obvious, in-your-face expressions of Lucifer in the media, but we'll be lured by the less extravagant, but still be disempowered by them. So just be aware. Beware. Idolatry has, all through the ages come in sort of three main areas. Um, there's the God, there's the spirit of mammon. That's the God, the God of money, if you like, of possessions and greed. The worshippers of this God of mammon today might say, never enough. You know, someone says, how much money is enough? The answer, just a little bit more. You're always that lure of more things, more possessions. You've got the nice house, now I've got to get the nice boat, now I've got to get the nice holiday. Then you know, it's, it's, There's always more. I'll be happy when? When I've got this, when I've got that, when I've built up to this, when I've got this savings account. And the spirit of mammon that existed in ancient times still exists as a lure, as an attraction, as an idol for people today. The next is Baal, the god of power and the root of all pride. It's all about self-achievement, self-sufficiency. Reflects on the image of saying you don't need God, you're strong enough to control yourself. Power, pride, success. And the lure of money, of power, and the third is the area of pleasure. In the Old Testament, there were the Asherahs, the Asherah poles, there was Asher, Ashtoreth, the goddess, and often it's tied in with pleasure and with, with sexuality with lust, and the worshippers who live by this creed, and, and just generally pleasure is more than that, it's, but that's one part of it. The creed would be, if it feels good, do it. The motto of today, if it feels good, if I'm not hurting anybody, I'll just do it. I can do anything I want. I can be anyone I want. No one's going to tell me what to do and how to live my life. That's the motto of many in the world today. And these are the three areas of idolatry today. And Chris Hodge, Hodges writes, these false gods, power, money, and sex, have been warring against our relationship with the living God from the very beginning. Whether you go right back to the Garden of Eden, or whether you look at the temptations of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, these are the three areas of temptation, of power, of money, and of pleasure that can... Beset us. So here we go. We've got this. We've got this incredible story. When the audiovisual experience occurs, bow down and worship it. And that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the other Hebrew people who were living in Babylon at the time, were told to do. So we're going to keep reading on because the next uh, the next point is simply that we need to be encouraged by the resolve of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the, in the midst of, of, of this challenge. Remember, they're told that if they don't do what the king says, they'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. The culture says, you don't bow down and worship the things that matter to us, we'll ostracize you. We'll ridicule you. That's what we get today. But we don't get thrown into fiery furnaces like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do. Nevertheless, in our society today, 
when the whole world is basically calling us to forsake our love for Jesus Christ as the Son of God and follow after worldly things. God shows us that we can be true to him and we can stand firm in the midst of that cultural barrage. And we can be encouraged by the resolve of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. When you feel the peer pressure to conform to the ungodly beliefs and practices of this world, be amazed, be strengthened by these three young men. And their faith. Let's read on. Ch Daniel chapter 3. We're going to read a bit of a chunk here. Chapter 3 and, and a few verses uh, here about the fiery furnace. Anyway, so some of the astrologers went to the king and they informed, informed on the Jews. There were some dobbers around, okay? And they, that was the word we used when I was at school anyway. You dobbed on your mates. You weren't, you weren't a good guy if you dobbed on your buddies. Anyway, these Jews were dobbed on. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. Symphony orchestra. The decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a flaming furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. And they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods. They do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage, and he ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. And when they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue that I have set up? I will give you, oh, he was so gracious. He liked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He liked Daniel. They had proven themselves to be very wise, greater than all of the other nobles in the land. He wanted to give them another chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, even though I like you, I have to set an example here. You will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God, will be able, what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power. Your majesty. What incredible faith. We'll come back to these couple of verses. Verse 18 though. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Wow, ouch. And then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. And so they did. They tied them up, they threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire for the furnace, the flames even killed the soldiers as they threw the men in. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. Well, there ends the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What a sad finish. What a sad story. I need some kids in here to sort of go, oh, but no, they, they survived. They got out. Verse 23. Verse 24, and suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. 
or looks like a son of a god. Different translations. Amazing. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. And then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them, amazed. And they saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. I love that. What an amazing story that we have recorded for us. A historical account that we have recorded for us. From the times of the Babylonian Empire, from the times of King Nebuchadnezzar, Real people, real empires, true stories, based on history. And these men, thrown in the fire, came out alive. I love the faith is demonstrated by these men. They're not going to bow down and worship another God, even if it costs them their life. But they've also got incredible faith for God to save them as well, for him to deliver them from their struggle. Um, you know, we read those verses there. You know, they said, even if we're thrown into the fiery furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. They just believed that God was that they were young men. They had faith in God. They'd seen him come through. They'd seen him uh, respond to them. They had done everything right by the ways of God, and they'd been promoted to greater authority and power in the kingdom of Babylon. God will rescue us. What incredible faith. But I love also the second part of their line, which said, even if he doesn't, even if we die in that fiery furnace, we are not going to bow down and worship the gold statue that you have set up. What an incredible statement of faith. What a sensible statement of their commitment and their faith in the Most High God. In Yahweh, their God. They believe that God could do anything. We sang the song today that, that he won't fail. God never fails. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. But there was a recognition that in God and his will, if, if, uh, if they were to go into that fiery furnace and if they were to suffer and if they were to die, they were still going to trust in their God and put him first and hold on to their, their unwavering faith in a God who is true and is right and is to be worshipped, not just because of what we get out of it, but because wor worship is due to his holy name. It's, uh, it's easy to worship God if we think we're only going to worship him for what we get out of it. You know, if we, if we trust in God, we're going to be blessed. And there's, some, there's truth in that. There's eternal blessing, if nothing else. There's the blessing of knowing the Holy Spirit dwelling within, of knowing the joy of fellowship with other believers. But through this generations, through history, many believers in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ have suffered for their faith at the hands of cruel people, of regimes and dictators and various philosophies and isms. But they've had that same unwavering faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego sh showed when they trusted in God. There are lots of times when we're faced with, I, I, I guess in our own lives, even in our own regular daily lives, how do we respond to and worship God when, when things go wrong, when things are difficult, when we're facing a fiery furnace type situation? There might be health issues. There might be other personal problems that we're facing. We can learn a lot from the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had an understanding that God can heal, God can save, God can deliver, but they still trusted in and loved and believed in their God and their Savior, even if he doesn't save us, even if things don't go the way that we want them to go. Chris Hodges, even in his book, tells of the story when he heard of his own father's diagnosis of cancer and how it really shattered him when he heard the news. 
how, how, it, uh, it, how it felt deep within his soul, his father who had loved him and raised him, who had a, uh, a terminal diagnosis of cancer. And he said, do I pray that God will deliver and save and heal or do I have faith of acceptance, the faith of acceptance to say, I accept that what's happening here and I trust in you no matter what. And he said, in the end, it was a both and. He had a both and faith in God and there was a both and response. There was a temporary improvement in his father's health, that there was more time with the family, but eventually there was the acceptance that his time had come and that he would pass into eternity with his God and with his Saviour. Yes, God will save us, but even if he doesn't, we just love him and trust him and hang on there with him and believe in him and our faith is unwavering and we're certainly not going to bow down and serve the gods of this world because our, our mind's made up, our soul is secure, our feet are on solid ground and we're trusting in Jesus, trusting in God even if he doesn't. And sometimes that's, that's real faith, is trusting in God no matter what the outcome. That's real faith. Putting your trust and your faith in the unseen God, the eternal God, whose spirit dwells within regardless of, of the consequences. Amen. Well, let's move on. Let's for, remember that the final point there is just to, is as, we, as we wrap up, is to remember that you are what you worship. Ralph Waldo Emerson, an American lecturer, poet, and essayist, um, he said this about worship many, many years ago. A person will worship something, have no doubt about it, we may think our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our heart, but it will come out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshipping, we are becoming. And this is looking at that deeper issue of what we're worshipping. What are we obsessing about? What are we thinking about? What's taking our time? What's taking our money? What's taking our attention? Because those sometimes are the things subtly that we are worshipping when we're drawn away from the worship of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. How do you know where and what you worship? Just follow the trail of your time, affection, energy, money, and loyalty. And they will lead you to the truth about what you worship. We all need to think through and identify what we're really worshipping. Everybody has an altar. We might not have set it up in our homes like a pagan shrine, but what we value most in life will still often have a place of great prominence, either physically or in some other way. But first, let's just have a look and see how this story ended in Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar said, after this incredible event where Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego come out and uh, there's not even smelling of smoke. They haven't even got their hair singed. It's incredible. They go in fully clothed, come out. It, it, it's goodness, amazing. He says, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants. It's an interesting line there. He sent his angel. So many, uh, many theologians believe that this was a, a pre-incarnate uh, picture of, of Jesus Christ, the third person of the Trinity. Um, the fact that the, the, the word talks about being a, a God, um, although Nebuchadnezzar refers to him as a messenger or as an angel here in verse 28. Who knows? But certainly that uh, could well have been the uh, pre-incarnate Christ who was with them, the fourth person that the king saw in the fire. And there is another in the fire beside us when we're sometimes going through those trials. And so he says, 
He sent his angel to rescue his servants. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. And therefore, I will make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. I just think King Nebuchadnezzar liked making decrees. He liked making really, really, you know, radical-sounding decrees. You know, throw them into the fiery furnace. That'll stop them. You know, or, okay, no, we're going to tear them from limb from limb and they're going to turn their houses into scraps of rubble, whatever. He, he made another de decree. And perhaps his close aides would have kept him to those decrees. There is no other God who can rescue like this, says King Nebuchadnezzar. And by the way, next week we'll be talking a bit about King Nebuchadnezzar and how God dealt with him. And then verse 30, so the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. And so they were rewarded for their courage, for their unwavering faith, for their defiance against all of the lure of the multimedia of the world that would entice them to bow down to other gods. You know, you often, you often hear of um, Christians who are persecuted for their faith. You know, soldiers are coming through looking for Christians, for people to arrest and to send off to prison or to kill. And you know, sometimes you wonder, wow, if that happened in our country, would I have the courage? And often you don't know until you're there, but you've got to have the courage, first of all, to be able to stand up for God in this culture against the gods that we see around us, the peer pressure, the internal pressure of the things that will lure us and tempt us and take us away from the things of God, that we might put God first in everything like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. You know, true worship really is putting God first in everything. Jesus said there are people uh, who are coming who will worship me in spirit and in truth. It sort of implies that there are people who are not worshipping in spirit and in truth, but there will, there will be those who worship in spirit and truth. We worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. And it's really putting God first in everything. Putting him first in our families. Honouring God as God when we meet together as a family. Putting God first the first day of every week by worshipping together with God's people on a Sunday. The first portion of every income or increase being given to God in a tithe. Putting him first in the first thought of every day as we come to him in prayer or in the reading of the word instead of going straight to our phones to check you know, overnight scores or to, uh, or to check what the latest thing on Facebook is or whatever it might be. Coming to God, the first thought of every day, the first day of every week, the first portion of every income, first in your marriage, first in your family, first in your career. Be consistent. Demonstrate your true worship because when you put God first in every area of your life, you can stand strong and love well and influence the culture around you. And I think that's the message, the lesson that we learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they stood firm. They held firm. They continued to love their God well. And they were able to influence the kings. And they were given greater prominence to influence people for good in the work that they would do. Let's be encouraged by this wonderful story in our Bibles that can help us to live for Jesus today. Marty and the band, we might invite you to come on up and I'll just uh, want to finish with a prayer while you get ready to lead us in our final song today. Let's pray. Lord God, I just pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego when we're faced with the challenges in the world today. Lord, in our neighbourhoods, in our workplaces, even in our families where there are people that don't know you and honour you, Lord, that we would have that unwavering faith in you, the courage to stand by our convictions 
about God, about Christ, about church, about family, about moral values, about truth. That we won't bow to the idols that are presented all around us. Lord, help us to be wary and aware of the many things that would lure us away. We really need your help, God. We need your spirit to strengthen, to worship, to work on our inner being, that we might truly live for you and worship you and be strong in you, that we would put, make you the object of our worship, that we would make you first in every area of our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thanks, Dale. And uh, 